ان شاء الله بعد دقيقه بالضبط انت دكتور طيب بس بركب الميكروفون تفضل دكتور السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته دي واحدة السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته دي بس في البث Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, uh, wherever you are, whenever you are, and I'm sorry for the hectic start, and uh, I wish that you are having an enjoyable, peaceful, safe time for all of you, especially at this very difficult time of the attack, of unexpected attacks of COVID on all of us. We are here in UK under a lockdown till next month. So not very, diff not very easy to move around. And we are at home trying to do our work as much as we can, inshallah. Today, as you can see, the, the title of our talk today, which I mentioned it in yesterday talk in Arabic, it is accountability of the trustees. Who the trustees are accountable to? This was a subject uh, given to me with all its information from young uh, volunteers, young humanitarian activists, young humanitarian worker, they're working in different organization and they send me this request to talk about uh, the accountability of the trustees. Uh, and because there were quite a few of them, I could not be able to put all the names on the front page, but I thank all of them as young people who would like to see how good their organization should be, especially on the accountability made for their own trustees and the trustees of different charitable organizations globally. I want to thank all of them, as well as thank uh, Ali Shawa, who is doing my media uh, production. Uh, in, my, in the index, there are about 11 points. 11 points, 11 points. First one, the introduction. Second, what is the trust? What's the meaning of the trust, especially in the theology, in the book of theology of Islam? Uh, third, who are the trustees? We talk about them quite a lot. Uh, four, who are the executives? Uh, five, who, what is the relationship between the executives and the trustees? Number six, the role of the trustees. Number seven, the characteristics of the trustees. Number eight, where is the problem? Why are you talking about this problem as a problem as uh, being raised by young uh, volunteers and young humanitarian activists? Number uh, nine, who holds the trustees accountable? Number 10, what are the problems that we are currently facing within the senior boards and the executives, especially the board of the trustees? Number 11 is the solution. This is the index which I prepared according to what I have been receiving from my colleagues in different organizations. But before we go to discuss this, let me congratulate the American people who over the last few months proved that the, 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 uh, the, practical, the practical way of uh, practicing democracy to the top, to the top, to the top, with the top transparency between these two leaders, Joe Biden and uh, Donald Trump. It was a neck to neck race. It was covered by inch to inch, centimeter to centimeter, uh, second to second, uh, minute to a minute, uh, hour to hour, day to a day, in this in this highly democratic, tra very transparent, actually, uh, race for the presidential uh, election. And I congratulate also the American people for voting. Nearly 150 million people voted for both candidates for the president to let them to win the trust. It's about trust. We're talking today about the trust of the trustees 
and are talking there as well actually uh, to congratulate the American people about how they uh, voted for the people that they can trust and how the two pres pre presidential candidates were trying to win the trust of their people. 150 million voted is about 45% of the population of the United States of America. And I wish that other nations, other people, other countries will learn, will learn, will learn from this good example and good practice to the American citizens. And I salute and I take my hat off for the American people. Thank you for showing democracy in action. And uh, why I'm talking about it now, because over the last two weeks, I was resisting watching the, the, the coverage of the race second by second made by many, 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 many uh, media uh, at that time, because I have a job to do and I have a mission to accomplish and I have uh, the message to deliver. So if I keep watching others, I will learn something, but I will not do my job. And this is why I was trying to stop myself watching the second by second coverage of the American election or the coverage of the American election over the last two weeks. And, and instead, instead, that's why you can see this uh, uh, image on the far right or far left, as you see it in your computer, is actually showing this is the house of wisdom in Baghdad, which has been created by uh, uh, Harun al-Rashid, which was the, the, the most powerful king on earth at that time. His kingdom was from China to Spain at the time, actually, because people were actually trying to tarnish his history, trying to talk very bad about him, unfortunately. And they did, in the history, wrote something extremely bad about his womanizer. He is, he is, he is, he is. That's why I try to compensate the time which is left for me to watch the presidential election by <coughs> watching and following the drama of Harun al-Rashid to learn something uh, for, uh, from it, actually from some history from it. But people like you, young people, might say, why are you going to learn history from drama? I said, yes, I can learn some history, but not the full history. If the drama give me 30 to 40 to 50 percent of the actual, actually, uh, uh, history, it's good for me to start going deep down to other avenue to learn more and more and more about it. because a lot of Orientalists disfigured and this image the, this image his the, his uh, disfigured this image in the history of Islam or in the history of humanity. This is why I was actually using that. This happened to me before. In 1991, when the war in Iraq started and CNN was lie was. Uh, putting the war live yani, uh, on the television. Everybody was watching. I was, at that time, I failed my exam and I uh, had to submit my thesis before November 1991. And I have a colleague of mine who was bogged down in recording. At that time, there was a video, there was a cassette recording all this coverage of the war in Iraq because it was a, a phenomenon. And for myself, I used to go at night finish in the, in, in the hospital, go at night to watch the summary of the news, and that's it. That's why I passed my, my MD, and unfortunately, he went back to his country with about 40 or 45, uh, three to four hour video, but actually with no MD or no uh, degree. Here, my message to you, my young people, my young brothers and my young sisters, wherever you are, whenever you are about, if you are a leader, if you want to become a leader, you have to create the flow. And you have to lead the people to follow your flow, not keeping all the time following the flow of other people. You will never, 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 never be a leader if you keep following the flow of our leaders, but you have to create your flow and convince people to follow your flow. And this is my message, actually, when I congratulate the American people of this fair and transparent election and very fierce election, and actually salute all of them. Now we'll go to our talk. Uh, what you can see nowadays, it's, this is a definition, or this actually the statement given to me by <coughs> one of my colleagues. His name is uh, Jamal Turk, and he said, he said about the trustees, in most of the time, trustees are giving the absolute power to run the organization. There's nothing called the absolute, Jamal, or anybody else. Even, even the power, this absolute power have not been able to 
the prophets and the messengers of God, which are the highest supreme authority of humanity on earth. The people were questioning them. Their followers were questioning them. Their wife were questioning them. The children were questioning them, but nothing for free. Even they were questioning the Prophet Sallallahu and they were questioning the Caliph of the Prophet Sallallahu So they know what, you don't tell me that the trustees or the board have the absolute power to run the organization. Number someone. Some of them, some of those trustees behave like if the organization belongs to them, a private property, wrong, wrong, wrong. Any organization, charitable, humanitarian, social, and whatever you call a civil service organization, is a public organization, is owned by the community, is owned by community, and the community has the right, has the right, has the right to actually uh, ask them deep and heavy and difficult question. So they should not be above suspicion, above accountability, and above the law of the land. Because this will put the burden on our community, how to safeguard the organization with, when we face, we'll be facing trustees like this. And in his in, in introduction, he said that, why don't we use, uh, uh, want, want to uh, uh, deal with our organization like the private company or a, a pr private uh, company who are actually having at the end of the year, the General Assembly and the General Assembly will be able to make the board of directors accountable. Yes, not all the charity organization have a, a, a general assembly. Most of the charity organization that I know have board of trustees. That's why we're talking about this group of organization, not the one who are the general assembly. Thank you, Jamal. The definition of trust and where can we see trust? First of all, trust and leadership, trust and leadership. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari once upon a time went to the Prophet Sallallahu and telling him, why don't you appoint me as an emir, as a prince, as a leader of a town or whatever you call it? And the Prophet ﷺ, uh, uh, what is it? He put his hand on his uh, chest and told him, Abu Zar, you are weak. You are weak. You are weak. Okay. And it's a position of public trust, of public trust. It's not Muhammad's trust. It's not a private trust. It's not a family trust. It's a position of public trust. And on the day of judgment or the day of the rejection, it will be only result and regret when you found that if you were weak, he was not saying that Abu Zar was weak physically, but he was weak in the ability to manage, to direct, to control the community, not actually in the physical power. In spite of the fact that actually Abu Dhar was one of the first 10 people who embraced Islam in Mecca at the very early days. What he told him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, oh Abu Dhar, you are weak and it is a position of public trust. Verily, on the day of resurrection, it will only result in regret, except for whom? For one who takes it by right and fulfills its duty. The one who can carry the responsibility of being a responsible man before the community. And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about the trust that this is, a, this is what actually Allah is saying in, in actually in Surah in Nisa 58, indeed Allah commands you to return trust to their rightful owners. In another way, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in this Surah, you give the trust to the people who will be able and capable to carry the responsibility, not to be given it to your fellow friends or to fellow citizens just for, for, for good friendship or family member or whatever it is. And this is a trust and leadership or trust and actually governance. Trust is a manner of the prophet. In, in, uh, in Surah uh, Shura, Allah on the uh, tongue or the says of uh, uh, Nuh, uh, Hud, Saleh, Lut, and Shaib, all of them said, I am truly trustworthy messenger to you people. Yeah, and they are trying to convince the local community they, as their prophet and messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they are trustworthy. Believe us that we are trustworthy. The same thing has been mentioned by Musa in Surah uh, al dukhan uh, number 18. And he said to them, uh, deliver to me the servants of Allah. He was talking to Pharaoh, okay? Surely I'm a faithful messenger to you, I am a faithful or trustworthy messenger 
to you, Mr. Pharaoh, the Pharaoh of Egypt. So it was a character of the manner of the, uh, or the behavior of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, it's not only for the messenger of Allah, but also of the believers of Allah. Before Islam, everybody knew that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was called Al-Amin, the trustworthy, the most trusted individual in Mecca. That's why everybody was actually trusting him. This before he became a, a prophet. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Mu'mineen number eight, the believers are also those who are true to their trust and covenant. And if you are a believer, huh? if you are a believer, you should be become true to the trusts and the covenant given to you by people. If you are not fulfilling this, you are not a truly believer. This is actually about the manners of the believers as well. I'm talking about trustship, trusteeship, and trustworthy, trustworthy people. Uh, uh, treason or betrayal is opposite to trust, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, said, and as the uh, uh, Prophet said, لا إيمان لمن لا أمانة له ولا دين لمن لا عهد له رواه الإمام أحمد والبيهقية. Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said narrated by Imam Ahmad and al al Bayhaqi said actually what he said there is no faith for the one who has no trust. Listen to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and this hadith was mentioned by al Imam Ahmad and Bayhaqi. There is no faith to believe for the one. Who has no trust, and there is no religion for the one who has no covenant. And this is the heavy statement about if you are betraying uh, your people, your community, your family, your uh, colleague, and others, you will have to question your faith and you have to question your religion. As the Prophet said, uh, hypocrisy also is uh, opposite the trustworthiness. Yani, uh, the believer should not be hypocrite because hypocrisy is one of the signs of the three or four signs of, I mean, uh, lack of trust or actually not fulfilling your trust is one of the three or four signs of hypocrisy. As the as Allah, uh, as Prophet Sallallahu said in Hadith Abu, Abu Huraira, uh, uh, Prophet Sallallahu said the signs of hypocrite or hypocrite are three, okay? First one, if he or she speaks, they lie. If he makes promise or she makes promise, they break the promise. And if he or she entrusted, become entrusted, they betray that. Even the number four uh, criteria of the hypocrite is when they become, uh, you, you fall out with you, they become very vulgar and very rude and make a big scandal to you. And even the Prophet in another narration said, even, even if they fast, if they pray, and even if they claim that they are Muslim, if they fast, pray, and claim they are Muslim, that does not that does not stop them from actually when they break the trust and betray you. Uh, trust and the minor sins of the hour. One of the companions of the Prophet came, the Bedouin from the uh, Arabia, and he was asking the Prophet ﷺ while he was teaching in the mosque, actually telling him, uh, "Tell me about the hour." Tell me about the hour. Tell me about the hour. When is the hour? When? When? When is the hour? Okay. Prophet Sallallahu was very busy delivering his speech and he proceeded. He proceeded to carry on. Some of the companions in the mosque were saying that eh, Prophet ignored him because he did not like this. And this was wrong. The other said that Prophet did not hear it. Both of them were wrong. And when the Prophet Sallallahu finished his discussion with the people, and he said, uh, where is the man? The man who asked me the question about the hour. When is the hour? The man said, here I am, the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him, if the trust is lost, if the trust is lost, if the trust is lost, then wait for the hour. If the trust is lost, then wait for the hour. You know what happened? The man asked him again, how we lose the trust? He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if the matter is delegated to someone who is incapable of carrying it is responsibilities. If you appointed somebody who is incapable, and this is what we can see in our days globally, globally, if I talk about, I traveled a lot to many Muslim countries and many Arab countries and see that 
most of the people appoint on the high seat and the front seat on political ground, on social ground, and economical ground, on media ground, and every, every social aspect of life are those people who are incapable to carry the trust. And this is what the Prophet Sallallahu forecasted uh, more than 1400 years ago to this Bedouin man. And he said to him, if the matter is delegated or the responsibility is delegated to someone who is incapable and everybody knows he's incapable or she is incapable, incapable of carrying, uh, it's the responsibility of such uh, uh, issue. Scholars become different يعني, about uh, the trust and the nature of the trust. And the Qurtubi عنه, يعني, said in his explanation about this verse, uh, uh, indeed, we offer the trust to heavens and to earth and to mountains, but all this great gigantic creation of Allah refused uh, to bear the, or declined to bear its responsibility. Uh, being fearful of carrying or bearing the responsibility of trust, of amana. But human beings like you and myself, okay, assumed it. Oh, lovely. I would become a president. I'll become a queen. I'll become a king. I'll become a minister. I'll become whatever you call it. And uh, we assumed it. Why? As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, for they are truly wrongful. Wrongful to themselves and ignorant of the consequences of not being able to carry the responsibility. And this came fi al Surah Al-Ahzab, Al-Ahzab chapter, now, uh, verses 972. Then uh, uh, Al-Qurtubi said the, full, the, full, the faithfulness extends, become very comprehensive. Faithfulness or trust, very comprehensive, very comprehensive. Uh, to all the functions of religion according to the correct sayings. And any function of the religion is becoming a part of the trust or a part of the trust uh, or faithfulness that you can do it. <sighs> definition of trust, different definition of trust. Accordingly, everything that a person like you and myself is assigned to do according to the law, the local law, custom or habit, he must do it. And this is a part of a trust being brought onto him. So prayer is a trust. Washing myself from impurity is a trust. Keeping uh, secrets, uh, secrets of other people is a trust. Raising children is a trust. In the job you are entrusted to fulfill your duty as an officer in the organization, yourself as a soul is a trust, your organs like eyes, mouth, tongue, nose, ears, hands, heart, kidney, uh, liver are uh, trust as well. And the man like you and myself or the woman like you and my others, they must protect these organs from using them other than what they were created for. And don't come and tell me, oh, yes, I can do the smoking because this new way now of having a different, different uh, things which does not affect my lung or does not affect my heart. You see, uh, the more of which is not harmful, Okay, become harmful sometimes. Uh, the more, like actually people can say that uh, I don't, beer does not come, does not make me uh, drunk. But if you drink five or six pints, you will become drunk. So the more you drink from something which cannot make you drunk, if you drink one small cup, becomes unlawful or becomes haram. So don't play actually this game with what the Prophet is teaching and Allah. So this is a trust. And all the who are the trustees now? And this is our third part of our discussion. They are the image of the organization, and they should reflect the diversity of the community itself. If we are living in a country like UK, multinational, multi-faith, multicultural, multi-race. If we are living in a country even like Yemen or Saudi Arabia or Syria, there's many, many, many 
com different community components. Whether we talk about actually Shia, Sunni, Salafi, Al Hadith, and others, we talk about women, men, we talk about even uh, uh, Yazidi, we talk about uh, what else, uh, we talk uh, in their uh, other religion and other group. You know, they have to be included, they have to be seen. Christian, whether they are Coptic, whether they are uh, uh, Maronite, whether they are uh, Catholic, whether they are uh, Protestant and others. So this have to, to have to show the diversity of the community that they are presented. Uh, they are the defenders of the organization in their famous, uh, on their forum, on the, when they are actually sitting in their offices, they, some things, uh, somebody talk about, bad about their organization, they have to defend this organization. They are the guardians of safeguarding the strategies of the organization with the executive, they safeguard the uh, strategy of the organization and they are the supreme authority over the executive and responsible before the government. This is the introduction for the role of the trustees. But who are the executives? The executives they are the ones in charge of maintaining the operational processes, organizational management and direction on daily, day to day basis, hour by hour, day by day, and week by week. They are those who are responsible for making every effort to alleviate the suffering of the poor and needy, which are the actual owners of this organization. Keep putting at the back of your mind that this organization as public organization belongs, belongs to the poor and the needy. They are the owner of this organization. So those executives has to safeguard actually the mission of the organization and make every effort to alleviate the poverty and suffering of those owner of the organization. They are the link between, on, the, on, on this right, right hand side is the donors and on the left hand side are actually the recipient of the fund. They are in the middle, try to maximize how much they can take from the donor money to reach the people who are in dire need. Number four, they are the protectors of the organization assets, assets, properties, and the caring for the rights of the poor and needy. These are the executives. So we talked about the executives and we talked about actually the trustees. What is the relationship between the trustees and the executives? It should be based on trust, on trust, on trust. In my own history of life, actually, if there was no trust in me, 35, 37 years ago from the trustees who could not have built a huge uh, organization such as Islamic Relief that I can see today. And nowadays, every enemy against humanity is trying to tarnish any Muslim charity, any humanitarian organization. But actually, it was the trust from the trustees to the executive and myself and my team at that time. It's based on trust that gives the power side by side with the authority, power and the authority, which is actually empowerment. You empower the trustees. So you, you empower the executives. So you give me the authority, huh? authority, uh, and actually the power to exercise this authority as well. This is based on the trust built between the trustees and the executive. What is the role of the trustees now? Now, more comprehensive talk about the role of the trustees. I, would, I might have about 12 or 13 points. Let us start. First of all, protecting the mission, vision, and the values of the organization. Agreed? Yes, move on. Second, monitoring the development, success, and fair of Monitoring the development of the organization does not mean that you monitor only the financial income. Financial income is one aspect of the development of the growth and development of the organization. Performance, accountability, uh, credibility, integrity, partnership, and other, and other, and other. Supporting the executive. Their role is to keep supporting the executive, to keep supporting the executive, and to keep supporting the executive. And number four, not interfering. That's empowerment. Not interfering in the executive role. In certain organizations, even in UK, unfortunately, trustees made for them an office with any trustee can come and keep questioning people. So those people who are working with an executive cannot function properly because they will divide the executives into grouping, grouping 
this group is with this trustee, this group with this trustee, and each one of them will say sweet nothing to the ear of one or two of the trustees. So not interfering with the executive management decision. Number five, building trust between them as trustees and employees as a whole. So the employees has to welcome them as and has to trust them and not to become afraid that the trustee one day or the trustee one day will sack them if they do something which without accountability. Number six, building loyalty and trust between employees and organizational leaders. In the good old days, I remember some of my colleagues in the mid 90s, they were talking about loyalty to organizations. Some of the trustees with their uh, theological background said, loyalty is only to Allah. I said, yes, we all, we always we own that. We all know that. But Allah entrusted us to, to manage a big organization and they have to be loyal to Allah through being loyal to the poor people as well as to the organization that we are uh, the, uh, managing or leading. Guiding, monitoring, and evaluating the performance of the executive on a regular basis. KPI and others and uh, uh, every three months or every six months or every year and so on, so on, so on. Conducting field visits, yes, the trustees have the right to go to the field visit to see the project, to understand what's happening there, and even to listen to the, the, the poor people uh, needs and to listen to talk our stuff, but without, without interfering in the executive decision. They can report these uh, issues back to the executive and the executive will take the lead actually in dealing with it, not the trustees themselves. Finding, if whenever they travel the trustees because they might have the time to travel, they might find new human resources in this country or this country or this country or this country or speak, okay, be bilingual, speak French and English, Urdu, be Arabic, German and others. And actually they might actually bring these people to be uh, uh, interviewed by the executives if they are suitable to fit to be a part of the organization and exploring the new diff, the new avenue of fundraising and uh, capitalizing on uh, raising funds for them. Opening new channels of communication between them and the staff uh, to understand the issue facing the staff without interfering. I mentioned this before. Opening a new opportunity, financial resources and uh, uh, to the organization. Creating a well-known structure. They have to work hard to build the internal or the monogram, the organogram. They have, they have, they have to make it very clear. The organogram from the top, from the trustees, the CEO, the executives, then the heads of division, then the heads of department, then the heads of uh, manager of the, uh, uh, the officer and, and, and all this come down bottom up. And to be, you have to build this one then protect the organization from dubious, from dubious, strange, radical, non-humanitarian ideology, which could be found in different social media platforms or printed material. This is the role of the trustees. 12 points, 12 points. The last one is protecting the organization from any dubious, strange, radical, non-humanitarian ideology, which could be found in different social media platform or printed matter. What is the characteristic of the trustees? They should have characteristics and we should put them down. Like actually we want the trustee to fulfill this criteria. What are they? First of all, having long, a lifelong professional experience in the field. If I'm a doctor, I'm an engineer, I'm a teacher, I'm a lawyer, I'm a media man, I am a scientist, I, am, I, am, I have to be very successful uh, in my professional career. They must have diverse experience through working in more than one organization. And in their career, they should not be only working in one organization and that's it. And they never moved out of that village or the town or the city, okay? They must be successful in their own career. If you are working, if the trustee is working for the last 20 or 30 years in one company, after 20 or 30 years, he or she should become a director or should become a chief executive so to show that they have achieved a lot. Preferably holding postgraduate qualification. Yes, we need people who have the knowledge or the qualification or the experience as well. They must have been volunteering for more than one organization for at least five years. And for the, because this will explore them, will actually to the different dimension of voluntary activity that's been done in different organizations when they come 
actually with your own organization, which is social or advocacy or humanitarian or development or whatever you call it, they will have the flavor of understand what do you mean by volunteerism? What do you mean by the mechanics of working within the civil society sector at that time? Number six, preferably some of the board members should be holding postgraduate qualification. If you are working in a material organization, uh, this has been, all this has been, been suggested to me by young people like yourself at the mid twenties or the mid thirties, okay? Preferably the board members should be holding postgraduate degrees and the qualification in international development, conflict resolution, peace building, other humanitarian degrees, or any other relevant degree to their field of work. And if they work in humanitarian, they specialist. If they work in social, they specialist. If they work in political, they specialist, and so on, and so on, and so on. If you work in research and advocacy, different areas. Preferably having public figures. I mean, inside the organization, should attract public figures. Like people have been uh, honored or by the government or other governments or by the queen or by the king or by the president. And this would give more credibility to the board and the organization. They should be known that they are initiative making, initiative makers. I mentioned yesterday, one of my dear colleague in Kuwait, and she said, pay two dinar, you uh, win the two dar, two dar, which is dunya and akhira. And she built through this uh, initiative, more than 14 schools in different parts of the world. May, may Allah bless her and their activity. Her name is Sumaya al maimani I mentioned her as a young woman who actually credible and managed from raising two dinar, two dinar is about five or six dollars, actually uh, six, uh, yeah, yeah, six or seven dollars, actually to build 14 schools in different countries. Uh, does not have, a, or, or she, she should not have any political agenda, or she should not have any political agenda, does not, uh, to, to be known as an initiative creator, does not have or promote any political agenda. This is number nine, knowing the history of the organization. When I come to the organization, before coming to become a board member, I should know when it was started, by whom, and how it went through all this difficult time to become such a great organization. Then knowing the history of the organization and as a member of the ASPRA, which is a lot of us came from this area, they should be fully aware of what? Of history, culture, values, and language of what? Of the country, of the country that they are living in. Up till now, I've been living in UK and in Europe for the last 42 years plus, okay? And I still can tell you, People are here for the last 25, 30, 40, 50 years, do not speak the language, not only in UK, but in Europe. Do not go out of their ghettos, and they're still living in the history of the culture when they left their own homeland. And even if they go back to their own homeland, they found that the people in their own homeland moved on, and their ideology became out of there to the, their country of origin. Needless to say, they are isolating themselves from the country where the organization is. Uh, number 11 should be diversity, gender-wise, men and women, young people and old people, uh, uh, race, uh, faith, uh, culture, religion, if we are in this cosmopolitan, multi-faith society. And even if we are in an Arab country, which as I mentioned before, there's some of them on the, on, on the theological culture and the value background, they could be Syrian, but actually each one of them have a different uh, uh, background than the other one. The Tassis have no problem. They, when they come to a, a country like Europe or America or Canada or other, they should not have a problem with their uh, country of origin or they should have, not have any problem with other countries actually uh, that actually uh, uh, can actually tarnish them. Uh, they should be obtained at least in their own job. They should at least become a manager after the work of 15, 20, 25 years to see, to show us or to prove that they are actually managed to rise, rise in their own private career. Number 14 is another dynamic uh, 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 requirement mentioned by those young active uh, humanitarian activists and uh, worker and the volunteers, what he said to me, they should at have what? A test. 
a test. A test to measure what? To measure their mental, psychological, and intellectual capabilities. Something I have never heard in my life, but this is the requirement from the young people like yourself. Make this test to see the capability of the mental and psychological and capabilities and the intellectual capabilities of those persons because they'll be entrusted actually on the organization and this fund. Uh, number 15, sometimes and exceptionally, we can take trustees who do not hold any higher degree, but they should have a great amount of experience. But instead, we can choose the ones who have a long experience in different fields of social, humanitarian, developmental, and advocacy work. Yes, we, sh we should not worship only the degrees, because not, only, not, only, not, not each one of us is very good in obtaining degrees. But if they have experience, if they have history, we can actually take them with us. Uh, this is uh, what are the characteristic of the 15 points of the characteristic of the trustees. Uh, point number eight, what is the problem? Herba, he didn't come. We remember uh, going back to the first or the second slide and mentioned by uh, uh, Jamal, uh, what he said in the introduction, in most of the time, trustees are giving the absolute power to run the organization. Some of them behave as if the organization belongs to them. This is one of the major problems that we're still suffering from it now in certain organizations, I'm not going to make it general. But the other problem which happened more than 25 years ago happened and I heard the discussion between one of the trustees and one of the senior uh, country director of this organization. And uh, the senior country director of the organization asked the trustee the question, the trustee a question. He told him, who are you accountable to? You know what he said 25 years ago? I still remember in this discussion, 25 years ago, he told him, Allah, Anna trustees, I am a trustee only become accountable to Allah. He said, we should also as executive become accountable to Allah. He said, no, you should be accountable to me as a trustee. The country director told the trustees, how on earth, if you give yourself the power to be accountable to Allah, give myself the power to be accountable to Allah as well. It's not you only. And this is where we found there's a big problem in understanding the authority of the trustees. The authority of the trustees. Actually, from here came the issue of accountability. It has been raised because there must be a level of accountability for every level within the organization. From the trustees level to the cleaners and guards level. And no one should be above accountability. At every level, should be accountable to the system in, the, in this organization. Who holds the trustee accountable? I mentioned before how the, to congratulate the American citizen and American people who were fighting with the two presidential candidates and two presidential candidates were actually fighting very hard to win the trust of the 340 or 325 million people trust. So first one, uh, the trustee should be accountable to is a citizen of the country. The citizen, any citizen, whether he or she is a donor or he or she is not a donor. This number one. Number two, the poor and the needy, because the poor and the needy consider themselves the owner of the organization. When they see you for getting uh, uh, their issues and when they see us actually overspending their money on trivial things. So they have the power, the, the power to complain and to make you accountable to them. Uh, employees as well in the organization because they see and know a lot of things. And actually they have to be uh, uh, assured that if they start to make a complaint about me as a chairman or about me as a, a member of the board, I'm not going to be sacked. Is that right? It's happening, it's happening. So, uh, this man or this woman are, are a problem uh, maker. So don't listen to them. Then they sack them or they sideline them. This is number uh, three. 
Number four, the strategy should be accountable to the donors themselves, any donor, whether they give you one real, one dinar, one dollar, one euro, or nothing. They, you should be, you should be waiting for any question to be raised by each and any one of them. Number five, other partner organization in the field, because sometimes those organization might see some of your officers in the field work doing something bad. Like actually what has been seen about Oxfam and Save the Children about this actually safeguarding in Haiti and other places. They've been seen not only by, by, by uh, the government of Haiti and other, but seen by other organization as well, which you can report about yourself and the behavior of your people. The ministry or the government agency authorized to issue the permit of your permission, the license of your working, <coughs> and monitor the performance of the charitable organization and the institution. This, organi this uh, uh, organization or department, Ministerial Department has the right also to make you accountable to them. Uh, other officials in different ministries, particularly now if you are working in areas which there's an armed conflict like in Syria, in Yemen, in Libya, and other places, of course there are many security personnel, of course there are many intelligence in this area, and those two departments in any government will have the right through the relevant uh, government office to question you as a trustee and to make you accountable to them uh, as well, whether directly or through the concerned ministry that control your activity. Uh, the General Assembly, if your organization have a one layer called General Assembly, fine, General Assembly can do that for you, or the supervisory council that you can create for yourself. Number nine, uh, which is very broad, academics, because they are very good readers and they know more than we know, uh, media prof prof professionals, because they can communicate the good story and the bad story about you and me, uh, members of the trade union and other, other unions in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the country, parliamentarian, lawyers, uh, legal, the public figures, and, and others, those, all those people are actually eligible to make you accountable to them. Even foreign embassies uh, in, and the international organization have the right to raise the question because through the embassies in different countries, they can see the ill behavior of such an organization. So they can actually, through their channel of communication, can make you accountable to some uh, problem. They might not interfere, but they can report to their own government and their own government can actually report to your own government or to the international community. What are the problems? Yes, we talked about this. There's some problems happening as I speak, happening as I speak or as we speak. Number one, the problem facing the boards, particularly the board of trustees and others, is like number one, lack of transparency in choosing trustees, as well as selecting and hiring employees. There's a lack of transparency up till now as we speak. It's number one. Number two, not following the policies and the strategy that should be a reference for all employees and trustees. Yeah, and you will spend thousands and thousands of dollars and dinar and sterling and others making policies and strategy, but we do not follow it. We just show it to our guests and to our guests and to our uh, honored guests. This is our strategy, this is our policy. Hey, hey, hey but we never follow it, unfortunately. This is uh, number two. Number three, you know, being inclusive. We only, we only open our door to one part of our community, to a certain sector of our community. Of our community. Not being inclusive to benefit from more from different human resources of our society, not being inclusive. Number four, being selective in employment and appointment based on what? Ideological background, clan background, tribal background, religious dogma, sectarian divides, family connection, and others, and others. We're still happening. I'm talking about problems that I can see not in the Middle East, not in North Africa, not in Asia, not in Africa, but in UK. Unfortunately, we're still bringing all these illnesses which you brought from our countries, but we cannot get rid of it. Uh, lifelong membership. Some trustees, I saw them maybe 20 years ago and still up to now trustees. It looks like uh, 
lifelong membership of those board members. They don't want to move because they believe that they are the only people who can safeguard the organization. Number six, no, no woman represented in the trustees or the directorship. Even here, let us let me talk about certain Muslim organization. Maybe one of them saluted or was, was يعني, celebrating having one or two board members as women. Yani, but the rest, unfortunately, yeah, the UK one, I couldn't be able to see a lot of humanitarian organizations having that. Maybe one organization, alhamdulillah, now have three or four, which is good, but actually we need it to be a part of the culture of the organization. Like on young people, there's no young people. All people are at my age, actually, which I'm very young, as you understand. The unrealistic fear, fear of for the organization, oh, we are the only people who can protect their value, who can protect the morality, who can protect the, uh, the history, who can protect the, uh, what else, the organization. If we go, the organization will collapse, the organization will die. This kind of uh, unrealistic fear is fake. You are a failure because you don't have the people who can actually take the leadership from you to keep protecting the organization, whether from your group or from other groups. Uh, marginalizing the role of executive. Oh, no. يعني, you employ a CEO and give him maybe 100,000 pounds or more or whatever it is, and you let him to become like your own personal secretary and actually he or she come to your office because you take all the decision to him. So instead of employing such an executive and paying such a high salary, uh, employ a secretary for yourself, give her 20 or 30 or 40,000 pounds and save the other 70 or 60,000 pounds. Uh, benefiting from the organization fund. Oh, some of the trustees could be benefiting from the assets and the fund of the, and this is haram, absolute haram. And we saw it, and we saw it, and we saw it. I had a phone call now, this morning or this afternoon from, uh, from Syria, and uh, one of the ladies uh, sent me a message said that she does not trust any more organization there because one of the organization in a very closed area, without mentioning the name, it started with a gentleman and his wife. They're very poor people and interested, but now they have a factory, they have, a, what do you call it, a farm, they have, they have, they have, they have. And this is sometimes, if there's no accountability, you have something like this, unfortunately, unfortunately. I'm not doubting the credibility of the good people who work inside Syria and outside Syria, like for excellent people, but this bad apple could be a bad example to all of us. Lack of awareness and understanding of the current reality, they are not living in the current reality. They are living in a cuckoo island. When they went to the cuckoo island and there's no cuckoo and there's no nest and there's no eggs, and the island is empty. The cuckoo bird has already left. So they're unrealistic. Living in a cuckoo island where the island does not exist, the cuckoo bird does not exist, the egg is not there, the nest is not there. And becoming uh, superficial and traditional in their thinking. Lack of awareness of the governing laws of the country. Because they don't speak the language, they don't interact and understand the law of the country of origin of the organization or the countries where work field offices are. Number 13, throwing the organization into the deep end through forcing unrealistic unplanned initiative, which are not a part of the annual plan or strategic direction. Oh yes, this is good. Don't have, it's not in our, it's not in our budget. It's not in our annual plan. It's not in our strategy. No, but actually, we need to do it. And this is sometimes where the power of the chairman, the power of the president, the power of being the CEO will actually could drown the organization in, in the deep uh, sea. Uh, what is the solution? And I talked about uh, 13 points here. What is the solution? After all these dark, uh, gloomy discussions. First of all, following the material standard and principles. 
and good governance, especially transparency and accountability, especially transparency. This is number one, transparency. And this was actually when the Prophet ﷺ was standing in the mid, uh, uh, at night with the woman, which is his wife, and some of the companions was pass, by passing them, and uh, he said, Assalamu alaikum, Rasulullah The Prophet ﷺ said, alaikum assalam. This is Safiya, my wife. So you don't need to say that. No, I have to say this. It's dark, and you think that I'm going to standing with the woman. This is Safiya, my wife. This is Safiya, my wife. This is Safiya, my wife. And this is a transparency. Creating a clear organogram, organogram, structured departmental organogram to show a clear distinction between divisions, departments, units, and disks. Divisions, department, units, and disk. Giving a clear job description for each of these components of the organogram. This clear job description as well as giving the authority to each of them to spend their annual budget, each desk, each department, each office, each, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, desk, uh, division, okay, and the unit have their own budget and they can spend it because you signed up as a chairman, you signed up as a board and you signed up as a CEO for it. Saying again, creating a clear organogram to show the clear distinction between divisions, departments, units, and disks, giving a clear job description for each of these components of the organogram, as well as giving the authority to each of them to spend their annual budget as agreed in the annual plan and budget. Clear? Clear. Number three, Approving the annual plan and the budget, yani, uh, as well as the strategic, uh, strategic plan for every three and five years, empowering the executives and not interfering in the executive affairs unless there is a failure in the uh, process of implementation. Uh, number five, establishing a policy for succession planning, succession planning for the executives, succession planning for the trustees, succession planning for both of them for both of them, for both uh, uh, sides of the organization. Building internal financial and auditing department, it has to be there. Accountability has to be from within, from within, from within, not actually from without uh, only. Creating volunteering system inside the organization, the spirit of volunteerism has to be brought back to the organization, even if the organization is 100 million or $1 billion or $2 billion. Creating a volunteering system, creating capacity building and human resource development departments within the organization as well. Capacity building is not on the agenda, it's not on the annual plan, it's not on the budget, unfortunately, because we don't believe in training people and empowering our executives and the volunteers as well. Following the state law that govern the work of a humanitarian social charitable organization, we have to be law, uh, law abide. Investing in building the, in, in the capacity of the volunteers and employees, we have to invest in human resources. I said it many times. They will become sick of me saying this many times, many times, many times. Adopting the policy of research-based research -based approach to sustain the process of development and sustainability of the organization. What does it mean? We should have research, 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 as a part of our budget, as a part of each each project and each program. Unfortunately, it's not in the agenda. Unfortunately, it's not in the agenda. Capacity building is not in the agenda. Training is not in the agenda. As well as research is not on the agenda, unfortunately. Number 11, investing in building the organizational endowment, which is WAKF, in to, that maintains a system of the organization. If we look at all the big educational organization on earth, like Oxford University, like uh, uh, Cambridge University, like uh, Harvard University, like others, we find that in Harvard University, the endowment scheme is about more than $40 billion. Give it the strength of sustainability. Do not rely only on the student fees. Investing in building organization endowment, which is WAF, 
that maintains its sustainability. First, I said that in the first 20 years, I will have to create this system or this scheme to enable us in 20 years time to cover the running cost of the organization, which is actually uh, the administration cost. When people nowadays come and say that I'm zero, zero admin, I tell them you are a liar. Unless you tell me, you tell me Mr. and Mrs. and Miss and, 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 and how you get your admin from and who gave you the admin. You have to declare that actually this admin is being donated to you, the admin cost, by a donor. Don't come and tell me, in the case of UK, that you take it from the uh, gift aid. Gift aid is the donation. The pound I give become 128 pence. It's a donation. So transparency and recording the income is vital. The first 20 years, I want the endowment scheme to cover all the costs. After that, to cover some part of the cost of the organization uh, program as well. Number 12, adopting the principles of connection, communication, networking, and building partnership as a basic, basic for protecting the organization and reducing expenses. I used to invent or have been inventing something called protection, connection as protection. The more you connect with people, the more they protect you in their forum and their organization. This is what I wanted to discuss with you today. I talk too much of your time. Well, I uh, thank, I thank my colleagues, those humanitarian activists and workers, the young one, who give me this uh, rich, uh, data to present it to you, very uh, controversial sometimes, but it's reality. Ask questions. Don't leave people to sit dormant through controlling their organization without asking them politely. You have the right because you are actually the defender of the trust in the organization, no matter this organization. And there is no organization, there is no organization could be called, it is ours. It is not yours. It is community organization. It's trusted by the community, supported by the community, and uh, helped by the community. Don't say it's my group organization. It's my family. Unless your organization is a is, it actually is is a foundation. This is your family money, and even with your family money, I have the right to stop you wasting your family money as well. I'm not going to leave you alone. Okay, thank you very much. Jazakum Allah khair. May Allah bless you wherever you are, whenever you are. I'm sorry that I took this amount of time from you, especially on Friday evening when everybody will be trying to relax in the, during this time of the difficult time of COVID. God bless you all wherever you are, whenever you are. And uh, I love you. I love you. I love you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.